focus. Let me start uh, sharing my, okay. This is it. You can see it okay. So first of all, good morning. Good early morning, good very early morning in the west of Europe, because I imagine that for Portugal and, and uh, United Kingdom and Ireland would be really early. I, I cannot imagine in Iceland that it's two hours, so it's really middle of the night. So I perfectly understand that we are uh, starting the day. So it's a pleasure to start the day with you. First of all, as um, as Chus has said, uh, I'm Linda Castañeda. I'm working at the University of Murcia that is here in the southeast of Spain, in the corner, east corner of Spain, in the zero zone of COVID in Europe, unfortunately, but in a very warm and nice place that you can visit whenever you want. You are cordially invited. The first thing that I want to say is thank you very much. It's, for me, it's, a, it's an immense honor to be here talking to you. And it's an immense honor to be in the, easy, in the ECTEL conference, in the ECTEL conference, because I was there. This is a picture of the, of the I have the first selfie of the ECTEL 2020, and I was there in the first ECTEL conference. I was there and it was my first European conference. So the, uh, the EATEL and the Technology Enhanced Learning Community is a very close community to me. And I have a very, a very uh, familiar place in my heart for, for this community, especially also because I'm not a computer science scientist. So I'm, I'm an educationalist. And what does it mean that I'm not a teacher and I'm not a computer scientist? So I'm in the middle of anywhere. So, well, no, I'm in the middle of education indeed. And when I received the invitation, I was completely honored, elated, but I was very, the responsibility that I feel is very big, precisely because I imagine that my, the kind of discourse and the kind of theory that I am working in is close, is very close, to, is, is in educational technology, is in technology enhanced learning, but it's from the other side of the river, from the educational point of view. And it's a very, very uh, specific point of view. So I imagine that one of my missions today, and I want to use this mission in the best way possible, is to be provocative, intellectually provocative. So for doing this, I'm going to say the things in, a, in my way, in the very passionate way that I'm saying the things all the time, but I want to do a disclaimer. So please remember that I'm going to speak about how the binomium education and technology is transforming or not learning environments, how we can do this in this post-digital world. When I'm saying post-digital, I understand post-digital in the way that you can see in the Martin and Don um, paper from 2019, when you say that digital is not adding any um, qualities today to, to, uh, to um, a name. If you say digital, the world is digital. Even if you have different approaches, even if you have different uh, levels of access to the digital, the reality is digital in our world. So saying digital do, do not add anything else. So we can speak about this post-digital situation. And my focus is how education and technology uh, is, are transforming or are not, and how could transform really learning environments in the future. And for try to discuss about these, I'm going to say some things that I agree on them, but not that much, probably. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to say that in, as I have told you, in the most passionate way, because it's my only way to say the things. But in some cases, is not that strong. Sometimes we can discuss many things about that, but today is the day for, for saying that in that way. Firstly, for starting the, the morning, I want to share with you um, a working hypothesis. Let's see. I'm not sure if you're young enough to be, to know this movie. This are uh, a machine for Matrix. 
1999. She's Trinity. Okay, Trinity needed to learn how to fly that helicopter. Trinity phoned the operator and says, please put, my, put the program in my code. And then she learns how to do that in that precise moment, in the most effective way, including the content in the code. And sometimes for in this, in all my life in, in educational technology and definitely in most of our life as, as field, it seems that our goal, that our main goal was this matrix, matrix learning goal. We wanted to help to teach to technology, to help people to learn whatever they want in the way they want in the moment that they want. But even more, we tried to use our robots, our automatization, our learning analytics, our patterns and our innovative tools not only to help people to learn whatever they want to learn in the way they want to learn, but even more, we try to automatize even the operator who is going to provide us the content and to introduce that content in our code. Not in vain, we are using robots and automatic operators for helping us to provide the, the, the contents. But even more, we have tried to automatize even the tech decision processes. We are trying to say to people what is better for them to learn, in what way, in what more effective way. Even more, sometimes we are, some of us, some of our developings are used to decide who deserves to learn what, in what moment, or who deserves to do whatever in what moment. Not all of them, of course, but some of them. And it was, we were working a lot for trying to get this. And unfortunately, or maybe fortunately from my point of view, we failed. We have not transformed the learning environments to that point. And this is probably because we have not a wrong perspective, but a very small perspective or short perspective of what is technology and what is education. Even if we are educationalists, even if we are computer scientists, some of us have a very, very short vision about what is technology and what is education. From some of our visions, uh, we have, uh, we have uh, proved that we have this small perspective uh, in many ways. There are a lot of uh, papers in the last decade, probably before, but in the last decade especially, and then in the last two years, especially before the COVID. Before the COVID includes everything, everything in, in, in literature is about COVID right now, but before that, there, are a lot, there is a lot of literature about what are the problems in educational technology. Uh, don't be worried, in the end of the slideshow, you will have uh, a link with all the, the, references, the references if you want to, to explore that. So, in what say the, that those, those papers? The majority of those papers says that we have failed, basically because we are too focused on quantitative and experimental research. Even if we know already for a long, long time that the quantitative and experimental perspective and paradigm is only answering to a very partial vision of education. And for understanding in a more profound way, the educational constructs and the educational processes, we need other approaches, not quantitative and experimental, but our main research is quantitative and experimental. In the same way, we have partial visions about what is education, what is technology, and even more, what is educational technology. Indeed, what if we have partial visions as partials that we are speaking of different things when we are saying technology enhanced learning and when we are saying educational technology. Even if the binomial is the same, we are speaking about different, completely different things. And this is problematic, definitely. Additionally, we have a, a problem with the paradigms. Not, it's not exactly a war. I have to say that is 
uh, it's more than a word is uh, I'm not sure I, I cannot say it properly probably it's a, a laziness of theory we are avoiding to speak about what is the theory behind our paradigm what is the theory behind our design research designs uh, and with this uh, and avoiding that discussions that are very boring sometimes we are avoiding to speak about what is education and what is technology for all of us and with this, we are avoiding to have the big discussions about where are we going to and what we are working for. Uh, and the most important of the lacks that I have seen in this text and in many of our studies, uh, and it's very important for me because I'm an educationalist, is that in the majority of our research, we have a very big problem of lack of educational designs. In the majority of the experience, we have done a an, an, uh, literature review of the last 60, 60, 60 years in educational technology research uh, experiences. And the, in, the major, in the wide majority of the most uh, influencing one, there is not educational design at all. Uh, the majority of researchers, we are very, very focused on the tool very focused on the usability, very focused on how to implement that tool, how to train the teachers for doing this or that, how to, but what about the educational design that is behind? Nobody cares about that. And this is a really big problem. Additionally, we have a perspective about what this technology that is very, very basically uh, focused on technology as an instrument. And definitely technology is an instrument but technology is much more than this. Instrument is just a way for understanding technology. And the philosophers of technology are really, really, uh, have really, really interesting recent works about this. On the other hand, we understand education as a kind of mechanism to provide people of skills. If you provide content to someone, that person can get this skill in that way. And this is our perspective of our education, the most of our work. And this represents a very big problem. Why? Because, uh, well, if, you, if we can see this in a most visible way, it has been in these unpredictable times that we, are really, uh, that we are living right now. I don't want to speak about uh, COVID as an opportunity. I think it's, uh, I, I'm, so, I'm sorry, but I, I imagine that this kind of tragedy cannot be used as an opportunity. We can use it as an, an, as an excuse, as a whatever, but a tragedy of this size cannot be seen as an opportunity. Well, sorry, I cannot do that. But anyway, uh, this crisis has challenged us to do some things that we didn't do before, and to use many things that we have transformed theoretically before. At least us, the educational technology people, because when the COVID crisis came and everything went online, everybody saw to me, turned the vision to me to say, hey, precisely, we were talking about you. Oh. You can see this in there. There is a lot of, of uh, literature about the COVID crisis and how we have answered to that crisis. Even more, we have amazingly interesting reflections about what we have learned for, from this time. But we have discovered, especially when we went, when we started to be on the lockdown and we went online. We discovered many things about our reality in, in online learning and at the university. We discovered that, for example, and the majority of the European universities, not only in mine, but I imagine that many of you can, can share with me this vision. The majority of our universities had a lot of good infrastructure in terms of tools. Our university has a lot of in infrastructure in terms of tools, but the other problems emerge when we went in a serious transformed learning environment. So in this transformed learning environment show us this short vision that I have told to you uh, uh, just two minutes ago, 
in, in, in a very evident way. Let me see. When we, when we try to transform the learning environment and when we try to uh, be involved in a transformed learning environment, we remember something that educationalists and psychologists, some of them, are saying for a long, long time. And is that learning is not something that happened. Learning is something that emerged and is an activity that emerged and is situated. And, it do not, uh, and this not only means that when you went from the university building to your house, you will change the spaces and resources for doing the teaching. Indeed, everything in terms of spaces and resources change. Not only the official and institutional and formal, and formal spaces and resources, but also the personal resources and the physical resources of people. The famous conciliation problems of the Zoom calls, when you see people jumping around you and that are your child or your, and this is our situation as teachers, imagine you are students. But it's not only, th this is the most uh, obvious change of technology working in this situation. But when you change the technology, technology not only changed the physical situation of education, also change the social situation and the epistemic situation of education. If you are curious, this framework is the ACAD framework, the Activity Center uh, Analysis and Design framework from Gujar and Carvalho that you can, you can say. When we are speaking about transforming learning environments, we have to take into account that technology is not only a tool. Technology configures relationship models, personal models, learning models, and institutional models. And even if we have invested a lot of money in technology, in tools, and in training about how to use those tools in our, in our institutions, the institutional model not only change in the, in the kind of tools that they can use, but also in the kind of uh, configuration models and relationship that you can include on that institution. One of the problems, for example, at my university, imagine, I, I can imagine that this example can work in some of yours as well. Uh, when we started, we, we know that we have a lot of um, tools for doing exams, but in our, in our regulations about exams, we don't have any regulation about online exams. We don't have any regulation about how to do different kind of exams that do not include uh, the 360 vision of students of being completely aware of this. We are, we have to take it into, a, when we seriously start to think in, an institu in institutional models that can be open to all these changes uh, that the technology configures, we have to think in different institutional models, how to um, open the flexibility to include online and offline, how to include those, uh, the, the problems that we have when we are going online, uh, people that cannot be at the same time in the same way, that cannot participate on a video conference, that cannot be everywhere. All this kind of particularities that we haven't reflected before. Probably because of the scale, but definitely it's not only because of that. It's probably because we were too much, from my point of view, because we were too much focused on the technology as a tool. Indeed, when we think on how we have created or tried to improve or try to train our digital teachers, we have been focused in the pedagogical practices. We have trained a lot of uh, our students to be experts in digital educational contents and to generate and manage emerging educational practices in the best, in the best of our, of our uh, approaches. But we haven't, um, do uh, we haven't done uh, do the same effort to try to help our teachers to be independent learners or to create their professional learning environments, uh, their personal and their uh, social learning environments to learn or to understand how to improve and increase the reflective practice 
uh, as, a, as a way for improving their, their teaching using technology. And even more, the social commitment, we haven't thought on the, on the importance of being sensitive to the use of technology from the social commitment perspective. And not only at the university, because at the university, probably the surrounding of our students was even farther away than in schools. But anyway, we, now we are more and more uh, aware about how important is the content, the, the context of our students, the context of the family and environment, also in technological, in the technological way. Uh, for understanding how they are learning in our teaching designs. So if we want really to transform the learning environment, we have to think about that. And we, want to think, we have to think about that more. And we have to think about what is education for us. Definitely education is about skills, education is about competencies, but it is also education is about agency as well. And education is about empowering, empowering. Let me be more precise. We studied, and this is probably the basic vision about education. Education is to get skills. And if you are, I'm sure that you are familiar with this taxonomy. This is the Bloom, the Bloom taxonomy, taxonomy from Bloom, Benjamin Bloom. Benjamin Bloom was uh, the chief of a big team that created this categorization of uh, this is framework for, for categorizing the, the learning goals. And we have used this taxonomy of cognitive goals for a long, long time, since the, uh, 1956 indeed. And in the, in the starting moment of, of educational technology, we tried to help people to remember better, to understand better and to apply better. If we went farther, in educational technology. Right now, as, uh, as Professor Griff said yesterday, we are trying to analyze, to help people to analyze, synthesize, and evaluate skills, their skills, and their concepts to, to get new skills. But even more, we have tried to uh, improve competencies of people. And it implies something that the Professor Griff said yesterday, in the best approaches of our uh, educational technology designs or technology enhanced learning designs, we have tried to help people to develop complex, con uh, complex situation to understand and figure out how to work, to develop the competence to uh, work in a, in a complex content, uh, competence. Sorry, in a complex um, context. And this is about competencies, is how to learn with contents, procedures, attitudes, and ethics at the same time in a situation. The problem is until now, that, and this is okay, we are working on it. Even if some of us are still on here, some of the educational technology are still worried about remember, understanding, and applying. Some others are really focused on competencies, and that's good. The only thing, the only thing is that the Sometimes we understand that the competence is something that happened uh, individually to someone that is um, responsible to develop their own competence. And we don't remember that we have to situate it, to be situated, and that skills and competencies are situated. So, for example, Coming back to the example of teachers, do you remember that we have talked about the competencies of teachers nowadays? If we speak about how the, what are the competencies, the digital competence of teachers, uh, we have a, a great framework uh, in Europe that try to um, shape what is the digital competence that our teachers have to do, have to have, but the competence is something that we understand as something individual. Each teacher must improve its own competence. And we don't remember that teachers are in a system. Teachers are in institutions. And those institutions must uh, need to create institutional models that help them to situate their competence. Indeed, we, I'm now uh, part of this project. This project is the CUTE project. It's an Erasmus Plus project. 
uh, with these amazing people that you can see in the left part of the slide. And we are trying to create and help our institutions to uh, improve their strategies for fostering and supporting the digital medium, indeed, the, comp the digital competence for teachers. Why? Because even if I am really competent from the digital point of view, imagine that I'm really competent from the digital point of view as a teacher, if my institution do not have the, the mechanisms, not only the digital mechanisms, not only the instrumental mechanisms, but also the organizational mechanisms, the administrative mechanisms, and even the supporting mechanisms, I cannot enact my competence. Also, if we are speaking, so if we are speaking about transforming learning environments, we have to remember that above skills and competencies, at least from my point of view, because I'm an educationalist, uh, the mission of education is to empower, to empower people. And for empowering people about that learning, we need basically two big uh, components. We don't, we, not need, we don't need only to provide them with resources to, or creating the conditions to use or learn, whatever, but providing resources to and creating the conditions to decide, decide to use, decide to learn. When I'm saying deciding, I'm speaking about exactly this, about agency. In what way, when, when, when we speak about educational technology, we have to speak about how to help people to give them the conditions and the resources to decide to use technology. For example, in the case of uh, the data agency that we are speaking a lot about that in the, last, in the last year. Right now we are, for example, we are starting right now on an Erasmus project called DALI that we don't have still, uh, we don't have the, uh, a web page yet, but if you are if you're curious, you can follow the hashtag. We are trying to imagine how to improve the resources and the opportunities of people, of adults, for improving their data agency. How to improve their, their possibilities to decide to use. But also we are speaking, I am speaking about how to improve the agency of learning, how to help people to provide resources and conditions to decide to learn, to learn what, in what moment, and in what way, in the most effective way for them. Not advice for anybody, but for themselves. This is in the core, uh, in the core of this idea is a, a, a concept that I'm working for a long, long time, that is a personal learning environment. Uh, personal learning environment from the holistic point of view, from the social material point of view, not only from the technological or from the pedagogical point of view, from the, for the educational point of view, as this um, social material entanglement where you include all your tools, activities, uh, attitudes and mechanisms to access the code, recreate and discuss and controverse uh, about uh, one information and you can learn. Because we really understand that PLE can be a, a framework for understanding the lifelong learning agency in this wide perspective about personal learning environment. Also, we need to not only to see this in, a, in this holistic um, personal way, but also we understand that we have to take more, be more, take care of this element of the agency elements in our educational designs. We have to take care of the individual social and contextual resources and opportunities that we are creating in our learning designs for giving, for giving agency to people, to enact their agency, how they can decide how education and technology are working for helping people to take decisions and to learn in a more for being agents of their own of their own learning, this is empowering. But beyond that, there is an, an agency is to very. I know that it's very ambitious, but we must be ambitious. Indeed, 
I think the matrix learning, the matrix, the movie learning uh, goal is a very, uh, a very ambitious one. I'm not sure even from the human point of view, but it's a very ambitious one. Uh, but I can see it's a very ambitious one. And probably if, if we want to go farther, we have to be more ambitious and to go for another very interesting concept that is sovereignty. Uh, sovereignty is sovereignty is speaking about who has the control, who has the power, who has the power of digital. I kindly recommend you the Luciano Floridi uh, paper from two months ago, I think, twenty twenty about digital sovereignty that is speaking about states and about people and about companies and it's very, very interesting. But today I want to, to focus on learning sovereignty. Who is deciding what I am learning, how and when, how self-directed I am. It's a concept, it's a double loop concept that we have managed for a long time, but it's, it's good to remember that. But even more, what, who is in control of our educational sovereignty? Yesterday, in some of the discussions, uh, supranational organisms as the OECD or as um, companies, precise companies that has their own objectives about education, uh, went out to the discussion for saying us what are the standards, what are the good things for education, who is good and who is bad? Who is, what is the good country and what is the bad country in terms of education? So who's in charge? Who is, who is uh, enacting the sovereignty in education? And this is a good discussion that we have to do. Uh, we have to do that discussion because when we are speaking about that education must empower, we have to discuss about agency. We have to discuss about sovereignty in learning and education. And if we really want to transform the learning environment uh, from the education and technology point of view together, uh, we have to open our discourse to other voices and other thoughts, definitely. We are, I, I understand our need to have at least one common language, yes? And, if you have been here for more than 10 minutes or for more than three minutes, you, you can see that it's a kind of, it's a, it's a kind of common language. It's not, not, it's not in my case, always the same language because I'm destroying English all the time. But we have to think that even if we are using this language for communicating, we cannot imagine that the translation is enough to understand other cultures and other languages thoughts because languages is not only about words. One of the one of my best examples, the example that I that I love the most, is the example of uh, the word pedagogy. In German, pedagogy, in Spanish, pedagogia, do not means the same as pedagogy in English. Pedagogy in English is not the same. And when we are trying, when, when we are reducing our, our discussions to discussions just about what and not just about why, when we reduce our discussions about the theories, when we dis, uh, reduce our discussions, our, the other discussions, we are reducing the opportunities to understand what is behind pedagogy in, in German, what is behind pedagogia in Spanish. That is much, much more wider than pedagogy in English. It doesn't mean that we, we are more profound. We are only diff using different things. But the problem is when we're trying to go to the point in another language, we basically are hammering our discourse into English. And this, the result of that kind of hammering is that we are finally uh, doing a small, uh, we are not doing reflection. We are avoiding to discuss about these important things. And we are creating a kind of global discourse that ignore other discourses. 
that ignore other discourses further than the, than the Anglo-Saxon one or the or that one superficial that we have created in our with our translations. So we definitely need global discussions. It's really important that we all use our minds to, to discuss and to talk about important things from many countries and with a very multicultural perspectives. I remember yesterday when Carlos uh, introduced the, the range of people and the range of people that participate on Excel and says, and it's nice to have this multiculturality. And it's wonderful because we need this kind of global discussions. But at the same time, we need to open our discourses to another voices and to create this mutual recognition, probably not in, in 7,000 words papers, uh, uh, journal papers, but definitely we need to include that kind of discussions beyond the informal discussions to understand better. Because it's the only way in which we can uh, go farther the superficial approaches and we can really start to talk about the agency, for example. Agency, the resources and opportunities to enact uh, a competence or to enact uh, your agency as, uh, as a learner are completely different in Spain and completely different in Germany, even if we are very close. I, can, I, I have been in three or four uh, uh, online conferences this, in this lockdown time where many people obviously from, from Europe, from the States and from other big, big countries uh, said about uh, uh, the problems of equality and the problems of the, uh, the other discourses that we are ignoring. We're almost ignoring completely the African discourses about educational technology. Or we are, why? Because they don't have what? We are almost uh, we, from Spain, that we speak Spanish, we are also uh, ignoring a certain level of time, uh, a certain level of, um, of the, the discourses from Latin America, even if they speak Spanish as us. And we are uh, being, so we are ignoring us and we are not taking advantage of this amazing, amazing uh, potential, um, improvement uh, work, the uh, world that we have got for improving this global, this global discussion. Anyway, I really believe that if we go farther, we went, we need to go for, for improving the sovereignty or to give the sovereignty to, to people, to the people, the power to the people to improve the perspectives, to open the perspectives to open our perspectives about technology, about education, about what we are doing together. When I'm saying that we have to open the sovereignty, uh, to open the discourses, maybe we have to reduce the partial vision or to really speak it, uh, the partial vision each other to, to, to create a more um, comprehensive discourse and more comprehensive practice because it's not only about discourses, it's about practices as well. And definitely we need to, to, to think more in that, in that, uh, in that perspective. I, I have already said that a lot of times. I'm an educationalist, so my priority is education. And my priority from my perspective of the education is empowering, empowering people, empowering communities, empower, empower people as members of communities to be more agents and more sovereign of their um, learning. So if you are curious or you want to uh, read more about that, or you, if you want to know where, I'm say, where I said that, if I have written something about that, you have here the, the URL with some of the references and some of the URLs of the, of the projects that I have talked to you. And I, I, I really, I really say, I want to say thank you again. And I want to, to invite you to make me as many questions, suggestions, discussions as possible, because I'm sure that I can learn many things from you. So thank you, thank you, thank you very much.
Thank you so, so much, Linda. Indeed, uh, when we were saying that you were going to give a uh, thought-provoking uh, talk, we were not lying. Um, in, you were like putting the finger in some hurting places, you know? <laughs> <laughs> that was my, inten my intention. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm taking advantage that I am a kind of home. You, you met me when I was young, so, so I have this kind of permissions to say <laughs> some kind of things. <laughs> I wanted to um, maybe uh, while some questions appear in the chat, um, I realize that uh, sometimes we are calling the same phenomenon as you were saying uh, from different perspectives. So you were saying that we were failing, we were failing somehow in this idea of okay, this um, fact of being able to pass knowledge and being able to start it in your head and, su and suddenly make it happen whenever you wish when you are. Uh, in the mood of learning something to be able to, to acquire that, uh, that learning. So on the other hand, from our side, we have the feeling that many times we fail in the adoption of solutions that we are trying to pass. And I think that this could be indeed the double side of the same coin, that there are two people trying to reach similar direction and somehow they are not, um, able to communicate and to pass this uh, this knowledge or the means in order to to reach those goals i think that uh, there have been a lot of people like trying to push for uh users in the loop to try to bring participatory designs to try to promote trainings disseminations what do you think that is the the problem from that side so if there is a the and you i think that we have the willingness in order to work together and to pass it so what, what, the, what is the issue that we are not uh, grasping my dear truth if i knew the the answer to that question i would be the lady to <laughs> solve everything but i'm not but definitely i i have some ideas first thing is uh, i remember one of the and i always talk about this in that first Excel conference that i wear uh, it was uh, a session called What Went Wrong. I don't know if anybody of you remember that session, but it was about, it was about amazing technology things, amazingly things that we created in our labs and that nobody used. And I, rem I remember that because from Kemai, we, we presented something about an amazing uh, uh, an amazing tool called hexagon. Hexagon. Do you remember hexagon? Some of you, I'm sure, that remember hexagon. And nobody want, nobody use it. And it was an amazing uh, tool. The question is that we are too. I remember that uh, uh, that we are working in collaborative, computer-based collaborative learning uh, for a long, long time. We are working in amazing tools about doing many, many things. We are working about um, amazing tools for doing amazing and magic things. I'm seeing from my from the educational point of view, it's kind of magic. It's like, oh, this is amazing. We can use it for this and for this and for that. But then you go to the reality and talk to teachers and they say, no, I need to know if my students have a small piece of paper in front of them for the, for the exam. And all your amazing things about collaborative learning are wrong because they are not going to use it. The question is that we don't, we try to solve complex problems with simple visions. Evidently are not simplistic. I'm not saying that, that computer science is, is easy or, 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 or simple. I, I definitely no. Or, and, but I'm saying that we are trying to solve something with a simplistic solution, with a simple solution. We have a problem for, we need to collaborate. We can create a, a learning environment for collaborate. We can, uh, we need to improve competencies. We can create a pattern of competencies for creating a learning environment for competencies. But the question is much more complex and we are still working in experimental things and we are still working in descriptive things and descriptive research. And we're not going farther because the complex research, research in a more complex way is much more difficult. Probably because we have the schedule 
of the European projects and the papers and the fast academic work, but we need to go to the complex things. We need to go further, to go further to reconciliate not only the in education, what what is an I don't know unexplicable. Let me let, let me talk in a, in this free way. But in, it's inexplicable that in education, the only people that is speaking about technology is educational technologists. Now everybody, but now because of the COVID, because we were forced, but we are speaking about technology tools, but we're still not speaking about uh, new designs, about different approaches to what is content, what is context to what is the knowledge, how you create the knowledge, how you improve the knowledge. We are not taking that discussion uh, yet and this is a very big problem we are uh, in the and i understand that in the beginning when we try to manage the new animal is good but now when we have the animal more or less organized and we know many things uh, we we need to we need to go farther and definitely i'm i, I cannot follow the the um, the I, I cannot follow the the entire chat but i'm listening to i'm reading some names uh, names of of the Eatel uh, community as eric duval as pierre dillenburg as um uh, as many other people that, that are working uh, simon buckingham sham even uh, that that was in in kmi or that many other of you, I'm sure that you are working on that, but we have to open even more the discussion. When we are, when when we need to, if we need go to go farther and to be more impacting, really impacting, we need to we need to if we want to really transform the learning environments, not only transforming the learning environment that are created, uh, we need to go farther and to open the discussion much more. I think. I'm not sure if I have answered any any of your questions. Just yes, sorry. Okay. <laughs> so regarding this uh, idea of opening the discussion, so Marco was posing a question saying that okay, what was the impact of COVID on progressing the discourse on tell, and how should we be involved in the public discussion and at the same time innovate the scientific discourse? I think the COVID has two evident impacts. Everybody was forced to use the technology. And everybody, everybody, even the most re, uh, resistant people, discover that 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 discourse of the web to zero that everybody can use it, even if you don't have any any knowledge about computer science, was true. Oh come on, you can only writing your name and saying uh, publish, you can publish, and that was great. And this, in one hand, this was nice. But in another hand, these the discussions on the core and then the and the core of our institutions uh, change it. I think, at, at least in the in the institutions that I know, uh, the discussion the discussions change it from what is the next tool that we are going to sell, what is the next tool that we are going to implement, what is the next tool that we are going to train for, to why they are not using our amazing tool with this amazing training. And then someone says, mm, maybe because they don't have a clear idea on what is the next educational step that they have to do. So one, I think from, at least from my point of view and probably I'm wrong, the, the, my impression is that the COVID crisis and the lockdown and the going online uh, after the COVID crisis put the emphasis on the educational point of view of educational technology, definitely on educational technology, but on the educational point of view on, okay, the technologists have done their work. What about the education? What about the education? What about the other things? And even more, the tools are solved, but now we have a lot of problems with the social models that we are building with technology the relationship models that we are building with technology, the social, political, and ethical models that we are creating with technology. And this is also technology. And this is also about you computer scientists. And this is also about us educationalists. And it's about all of us educational technologists. So we 
need to think about them as well, not only about how technology, education technology could not be any more about how to use this to improve that, but how to educate people about this world that is post-digital, how to help people to empower on that world that is post-digital. So, and this is a very, very interesting uh, ambition. And from the academic point of view, from the scientific point of view, we have to think about that in, in many ways. We are the editors of our journals. We are the, we are the evaluators because nobody do the other things. We, indeed, we do it uh, for free. So uh, we are doing the, we are uh, editing our journals. We are uh, evaluating our projects. We are uh, evaluating the, the next research. So what if we try to make kind of change? to try to open our journals, our projects, our European fundings, not only to, to, fund, to funding for tools, to funding for developing things. That I have been in many, of, uh, in many discussions where everybody was aware about that. If you don't have a good tool to develop, you cannot get money from, from, the, from the EU, the good money. What if we try to put, uh, to make potentials on uh, longer, uh, long projects that can go farther and can, can explore in a more complex way our educational technology uh, environments? And we need this kind of complex thing. And it's not a complex thing about education, it's about education and technology and educational technology. Nice answer. I complete. <laughs> yeah. uh, there is another comment from Tobias. Um, so he was saying, okay, totally agree that technology has a much more profound impact um, than being just an instrument to get the task done. Uh, and you were pointing uh, to the activity theory as a potential framework that takes a broader perspective here. Uh, would uh, that be your number one choice for a framework or do you have other ideas for that? Oh. I, I'm in the middle of everything always because I, I my one of my one I think it's it's a good thing and some people can imagine that it's a bad thing but I'm never sure about what I'm uh, what, what I think because I I my I always in the middle of a big question but I really believe that uh, activity theory it would be a, a nice a nice perspective to understand learning I really liked the ICAD framework for understanding the learning design, the learning design, even if we understand that learning is something emergent, but because it's very simple, it's not simplistic, it's very simple. And using this, we can, we can use it this for, for understanding many, many other things about education, about technology, about learning design, about learning design in many different levels. So I like it. But in general, I have to say that I would love to explore social material perspectives in general. I think that this, we cannot continue speaking about how the tool works in that way, how people learn in that way, how people use this tool for whatever. Come on, well, I, I know that it's a very simplistic example, but when I'm in the street with my phone, in my hand, I'm never the same human that when it's a street without the mobile phone. Why? Because uh, for starting, I only have one hand when I got my, in the other my, my mobile phone. So I'm a completely different human. So it's very interesting to explore social material approaches to understand how they work in different learning environments and different, because, and not only, and taking into account that we are not working only with formal. One of the basic discussions that we have got, uh, got in educational technology for a long time was um, that formal and formal, I remember when we said formal and formal and formal environments for learning are less uh, clear and are more mixed. Do you remember? Uh, it is very old. You know, we said, oh yeah, the boundaries between informal and informal are less clear. And we have, to, yeah, but we are not using it when we are researching the things. We understand the collaborative learning environment is working apart from the life of our students. 
they are using our collaborative learning environment, but WhatsApp and Telegram and whatever is not with them. Eh? And if they're doing something in TikTok, it's not related to that. Come on, it's related, it's definitely related. So, and if they are in, a, in an only one bedroom uh, apartment or if they are in a house, it's a completely different approach. If they are in Murcia that is warm, to, now we have 22 degrees at 9.30 o'clock in the morning, uh, we are going to 30 in the middle of the day, it's not the same as if we are in Tallinn, I'm sure. So it's a completely, and this kind of social material, and this is a very simplistic way for, for explaining, but I imagine that this kind of, of, of complex approaches to what is happening with technology and with education nowadays would, would be interesting. Well, thank you so much for uh, this nice chat. I hope we can continue, uh, hopefully sure. in the near future, <laughs> face to face, what would be a premium situation. And uh, I think that uh, we may need uh, to give some closing comments before the end of the session. Yeah, Tobias is saying that we have 23 degrees in Tallinn, but I promise you that it's not the same that in Spain because I, I mean... <laughs> Never is the same as in Murcia, Tobias. No Murcia, sun, eh? Kind of <laughs> in any case, I think that uh, that Marco wanted to to make some comments in this about, uh, about the votes for the poster and demos, uh, so I'll let him the floor. Sorry, yeah. just one thing. I have just changed the, the URL, the, the access to the URL, because I, I think it doesn't work properly. So now it's working properly. Thank you. Super. Sorry. Sorry, Marco. No, no, no problem. Uh, phew, I first had to collect my ideas again after this amazing keynote.